8.55 Eastern Daylight Time and Elmer Davis and the News. Brought you tonight by the Gillette Safety Razor Company. Just time to tell you that today's improved Gillette Blue Blade, made of steel hard enough to cut glass, has the sharpest edges ever produced. That's why it gives you the quickest, easiest shave ever. Ask your dealer for Gillette Blue Blade. The first day of the German blitzkrieg against the Low Country seems to have met with only very moderate success. Both Dutch and Belgians are resisting fiercely, and the Belgians have already been, been reinforced by strong mechanized columns of British and French troops from the Western Front, responding to the call for help sent out by both small nations after they were invaded. The Dutch and Belgian high commands tonight flatly say the invasion has failed. German advance has been greatest where Holland and Belgium meet. They took the Dutch city of Maastricht, swarmed across the projecting tip of Dutch territory, and say they have taken some bridges on the Albert Canal in northern Belgium. Farther south, they claim to have occupied the town of Malmedy, lost to Belgium by the Treaty of Versailles. Attacks on France and Belgium through Luxembourg have been stopped so far at the frontiers. The invasion of the Netherlands seems to have been held at the Isel River, where the town of Arnhem has resisted German attacks and many, if not most, of the parachute troops dropped all over Holland before dawn this morning have been mopped up by squads of Dutch machine gunners traveling in fast automobiles. The German claim this morning that the Dutch capital, The Hague, had been captured by troops landed on the beach was not correct. Dutch troops and warships repulsed them. Parachute troops dropped a few miles from Queen Wilhelmina's palace with the apparent intention of seizing the Dutch sovereign, were stopped, our correspondent Edwin Harkrich reported in an earlier broadcast, by Dutch soldiers who fought them off in the tulip fields. Around Amsterdam, too, the parachute invaders seem to have been beaten off, but there is still fierce fighting going on in the streets of Rotterdam, the chief Dutch port. The German invasion was preceded by swarms of air raiders who attacked first, following the precedent set in Poland, Dutch and Belgian airfields, and also bombed far and wide over France. More than 20 French cities, ranging from Dunkirk and Calais on the Channel to Lyon in the south, were raided. And while apparently here, too, airfields, or in some cases radio transmitters, were the primary objective, the French government said that more than 50 civilians were killed. Raids on Paris and on the mouth of the Thames seemed to have been purely for reconnaissance. But incendiary bombs were dropped on a town in southeastern England. A raid on Brussels early this morning burned several apartment houses and killed civilians. But after a Belgian protest that Brussels was an open town without troops, the Germans promised not to attack it if it remained so. A late dispatch from The Hague says that no attacks seem yet to have occurred in Holland on non-military objectives. This afternoon, however, the Germans claimed that the German city of Freiburg in Breisgau, also an open town, had been bombed and 24 civilians killed. And each side warns of reprisals if the other doesn't stop it. An air raid alarm was reported from Paris about an hour ago. And all over England, people have been warned to be on guard tonight against parachute troops dropping during the blackout. The only bombs dropped on Switzerland appear to have been a mistake, but the Swiss are conducting a general mobilization nonetheless. And just before all this began, the British announced that they had occupied Iceland, so far as we know, without protest, to prevent its seizure by Germany. Winston Churchill has replaced Neville Chamberlain as British Prime Minister and will form a coalition cabinet. Its membership has not yet been announced, but Chamberlain will stay in it somewhere. Resigning, Chamberlain said that new and drastic action must be taken to restore confidence. The French Premier Reynaud took into his cabinet the prominent extreme conservatives Louis Marin and jean Barnagarai. Italy is still quiet, and a broadcast on the Rome radio this evening says that it was the blockade more than anything else which prompted Germany to carry the war into new regions where little resistance was expected. This is in flat contradiction of the reasons given by the Nazi leaders for the invasion. Ribbentrop's claim that occupation of the Low Countries anticipated by only a day an allied attack on Germany with Dutch and Belgian consent, and Goebbels' argument that the Dutch and Belgian governments had promoted, had plotted a revolution in Germany. And that's the news to this moment. 8.55 Eastern Daylight Time, and Columbia and its affiliated stations bring you Elmer Davis and the News. German land forces today made some small gains, but their advance is not yet very impressive. This is a three-dimensional war, however, and their command of the air has enabled them to make plenty of trouble in both Holland and Belgium. Parachute troops were dropped at more than 25 places in the Netherlands today, and Brussels reported that German planes were flying over almost without interruption, distributing parachutists over Belgium. In most cases, these small detachments seems to have been, seem to have been killed or captured. But besides the actual damage they do and the interruption of communications, they compel the detachment of a considerable number of troops to deal with them. 
And in the Netherlands, at least, this diversion is beginning to be a serious danger. Principal centers of the parachute attack today were Rotterdam and The Hague. Swarms of parachute troops were dropped there through the day, and the Germans still hold part of Rotterdam, including the Valhoffen Airport. This was heavily bombed again by British planes and apparently is of little use as a landing field. But our correspondent Edwin Hartrich reported earlier that many Germans had got into Rotterdam on merchant ships under the Swedish flag, and hard fighting apparently goes on in the downtown part of the city. The Dutch hold The Hague but have had to fight not only parachute troops, but Germans in citizens' clothes who have been firing from house windows and this morning made an unsuccessful raid on the police station. Between the plain clothes and the Dutch uniforms used by some of the Germans, it must be hard for the defenders to know just whom to fight. The German radio tonight claims that parachute troops dropped on the Belgian coast have forced their way into the town of Ostend. Nothing has been heard of this from Allied sources. It may be true and maybe not. On land, the Germans have crossed the Isel River near Arnhem and claim the capture of that town, though the Dutch dispute this. In northeastern Holland, where Dutch plans never contemplated serious defense, the invaders have reached Groningen. The principal success claimed by the Germans today was the capture of a strategically important Belgian fort near Liège, which they say was taken by some new tactics, apparently including air bombing, which proved that modern fortifications can be captured by modern methods. And east of the Moselle, an entire German division made what seems to have been a demonstration rather than an attack on the Maginot Line. The French withdrew from their advanced posts, and against heavy artillery fire, the German attack was not pressed. There were several air raids on Amsterdam with many casualties and bombs dropped on Brussels, which the Germans yesterday promised to let alone. Mostly, however, the air forces on both sides were busy bombing communications. Allied planes raided bridges, railroad junctions, and airfields on the lower Rhine, and the German attacks on many towns in France were chiefly directed against airfields. Both sides, that is, seem to be sticking for the most part to the attack on military objectives, but of course there are civilian casualties. The French reported 148 civilians killed and more than 300 wounded today, and the Germans report several dozen casualties from the lower Rhine towns. Both British and French have denied the German story that the open town of Freiburg was bombed yesterday, but German radio announcers are saying tonight that Germany's patience is exhausted. Apparently the Dutch, Belgians, and French are expected to go on being patient. And there was news of air fighting in Norway. The British say they bombed a German cruiser off Bergen. The Germans say they hit a British battleship and cruiser off Norwich. Winston Churchill has not yet finished making up his cabinet, but he will be Minister of Defense himself, and will be associated in an inner war cabinet with Lord Halifax, the foreign minister, and with ex-premier Chamberlain and the labor leaders Atley and Greenwood, these last three having no departmental duties. Anthony Eden, former foreign secretary, is to be minister of war. A.V. Alexander, laborite, is head of the admiralty. And Sir Archibald Sinclair, the liberal leader, is air minister. Or Simon and Stanley are out. British and French Marines landed today in the Dutch West Indies at the request of the Dutch government to guard the oil refineries there. In Washington, it was said that so long as the Dutch government had requested it, this action involved no violation of the Monroe Doctrine. As for the Dutch East Indies, the Japanese Foreign Minister Arita repeated to diplomats today that it was a vital interest to Japan to preserve the status quo, and Secretary Ho repeated his recent statement that any disturbance there would be prejudicial to the security of the whole Pacific area. The White House reports that comments received on President Roosevelt's speech last night were more than 90% favorable. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.